Welcome, my wonderful general chemistry students, to our uh, discussion on Chapter 19's coverage of chemical thermodynamics. Now, with that said, I'm going to continue where we left off on our discussion. You might remember us discussing a series of questions in which we had to identify which of the following had the highest or lowest entropy value. That takes us to this question, number six from our problem set. Of the following, the entropy of which is the largest? In order to address this, I'm going to turn to some pre-recorded footage I've made from our doc cam. We are now going to take a look at problem set number 19, question number 6. In this question, we're given several different compounds and we're asked which of the following compounds will have the largest entropy? I'm not going to rewrite all of those compounds here on the page, but instead I'm going to zoom into the actual question so that we can see it. You can see each of these compounds here. I've got HCl liquid, HCl solid, HCl gas, HBr gas, and HI gas. Which of those has the largest entropy? Remember that entropy represents disorder. The more disordered a system is, or an individual molecule, or a system containing that individual molecule, the higher in entropy or larger in entropy that system will be. Hence, the component of each of these options that has the most disorder will have the largest entropy. I think we can agree that compound A is a liquid and compound B is a solid. Both of those are much more ordered and hence at a state of lower entropy than any of the options C, D, or E, which are all gases. In looking at options C, D, and E, we might wonder, how in the world do we determine which of those individual gases has the greatest entropy? Well, we learn in our text on page 801 that when comparing two gases with each other, or two liquids with each other, or two solids with each other, entropy increases with molar mass. So as the molecular weight of something gets larger, its entropy gets larger. Hence, the correct answer to this question is letter E. And now on to question number 13. As water slowly cools from gaseous temperature to freezing, its entropy does what? Once again, to address this question, I'm going to turn to some pre-recorded footage on our doc cam. Another question that I want to examine from our problem set is question number 13. Once again, I think we can reason our way through this. This question is one that I do not want to rewrite here for you to see, but instead I'll just throw it up on our doc cam and see if I can zoom in so we can get a closer look and see what it says. So as we can see in this question it says, as water slowly cools from gaseous temperature to freezing, its entropy, what does it, its entropy do? If we reason through this in our minds, we can imagine gaseous water zooming around as a gas. It is very, very much uh, in a disordered state. Gaseous water molecules can zoom all over the place. There's not a lot of order, not a lot of structure. Very, very high entropy. As it cools, it gets colder and colder and colder. It finally becomes a liquid. And then that liquid gets colder and colder and colder and then becomes a solid. It is becoming more and more organized. Hence, its entropy is decreasing. So as we look through this, we can see any of the options that say entropy becomes smaller. Now here's the crux. If we look down here, we might think, well, becomes negative? Is that possible? I don't know. What about this becomes a zero thing? Is that possible? Well, as it turns out, we've learned this from our text and the lecture, entropy is only zero at absolute zero. Now, I've written that over here. S is never zero except at absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin. That is a theoretical temperature at which entropy is zero and which all atomic and molecular motion ceases. To give you perspective, zero Kelvin is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Very, very cold. So as we're going back here to looking at these answers, the entropy as we go from liquid water from gaseous water to liquid water to frozen water is not going to become zero unless we go all the way down to absolute zero. So option D is ridiculous. We can see that the number does not become larger or, neg or more negative. That would, a larger negative number would represent an entropy value that is becoming more organized. So a large negative number would be what we would expect going in the opposite direction. Hence, 
the only option that actually makes sense is option C. As water cools from a gas down to a liquid, then down to a solid, its entropy becomes smaller and smaller and smaller in value, but it still remains a positive value. Now we'll vault into a discussion on the third law of thermodynamics. We should keep in mind that while the change in entropy, delta S, can be either positive or negative, depending on the process, the actual individual entropy value, S, for any system, molecule, or element, will always be positive. In fact, S can never be negative. It can only be equal to zero if you're at absolute zero, zero Kelvin, which is equal to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, which frankly is pretty darn cold. This fact is summarized by the third law of thermodynamics, which states that the entropy of a pure crystalline substance at absolute zero is zero. As we learned back in chapter 5, we can measure delta H, which is the change in enthalpy, by using a technique called calorimetry. Unfortunately, there's no comparable way of measuring delta S. However, because the third law of thermodynamics establishes a zero point for crystalline substances, zero K, we can extrapolate S values from there. This figure shows how entropy changes as temperatures increase from absolute zero. You'll note that at absolute zero, we have an entropy value of zero. This is the theoretical temperature at which all molecular and atomic motion ceases completely because it's so darn cold. As we gradually increase a substance's temperature, we notice that its entropy increases in a linear fashion. Then we get to this point, which is the melting temperature. As we increase temperature, we'll see that a substance's, uh, our substance converts from a solid to a liquid as it melts. It's now all liquid, and its entropy continues to increase linearly as we increase temperature, until we reach this temperature at which the substance begins to boil. Once it's all boiled and converts to a gas, its entropy then continues to go up as we increase temperature. And the question that I think you guys should be considering is why does entropy go up so dramatically as we change a substance from a liquid, or from a solid to a liquid, in other words, its melting point, and as we increase the substance from a liquid to a gas, its boiling point. Entropy plots like the one that I just showed can be made by carefully measuring how the heat capacity, which we talked about back in chapter five, of a substance changes with temperature. Now, according to our book, quote, the theory and methods used for these measurements and calculations are beyond the scope of this text, end quote. Which frankly, I really believe. Nevertheless, we can obtain absolute entropy values, also called standard molar enthalpies, or S0, of different substances at different temperatures. Several of these are shown at 298 Kelvin, or 25 degrees Celsius, which is roughly room temperature, in table 19.1 that I posted on the next slide. Even more can be found by looking in Appendix C at the back of your book. Here is that table. If you want, you can pause the video right now and look at the entropy values for each of these substances and consider and think about them. Now there are a couple of details we should really point out regarding a substance's standard molar entropy, or S0. One, you might remember from chapter five that any pure element's enthalpy of formation, or delta HF0, is equal to zero. Now that is not true of standard molar enthalpies, which you can see if you look at the table that I shared in the previous slide. Two, standard molar entropies of gases are greater than those of solids and are also greater than those of liquids, frankly. And that should probably be pretty obvious. Three, standard molar entropies generally increase with increasing molar or atomic weight. And four, standard molar entropies generally increase with an increasing number of atoms in the substance's formula. With those ideas in mind, we now launch into this question from our problem set, which is actually a review question about standard molar enthalpy of formation, or delta HF naught. By definition, at room temperature, the value of delta HF naught equals zero for what? In order to address this question thoroughly, I'm going to turn to some pre-recorded footage from our doc cam. Another problem that I want to address is problem number 16 from our problem set. It says, by definition, at room temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, the value the enthalpy of formation equals zero for what? Any element? Any element in its natural 
physical state, solid state or uh, solid gas or liquid, any element that is not in its natural state, or none of the above? Well, obviously the answer is highlighted there, so you can see that. The principle that I want you guys to remember, however, is this. If I have any element in its natural state that it exists at, at standard temperature and pressure, and I look at it at in, that, in that state, its enthalpy of formation is going to be equal to zero. Let's take a look at a couple of cases. Oxygen at 298 Kelvin and standard pressure. In other words, when I say that, what I'm meaning is STP, right? Standard temperature and pressure is a gas. Hence, the delta H of formation of O2 gas is zero. However, the delta H of formation of O2 liquid is not zero. The reason, once again, is because oxygen at standard temperature and pressure is not a liquid. So if I were looking for the delta H of formation of oxygen liquid at 298 Kelvin, it would not be zero. This is very, very important. So when we're given a question like this on a standardized exam or something else, we need to remember to look at each of the individual elements and ask ourselves, is that element in the state that it normally exists at, at that temperature? If the answer is yes, then its enthalpy of formation is going to be equal to zero. By looking up individual substances' standard molar entropy values, or S0, we can calculate delta S0 for any chemical reaction. We do this by using equation 19.8 from our text, which says change in entropy equals the sum of the individual entropies of the products minus the sum of the individual entropies of the reactants. Now, Just so you know, N represents a coefficient in front of each entropy value of each product, and M represents the same for each reactant if there are any coefficients in front of them in the balanced chemical equation. Now guess what? You can totally do something pretty much exactly the same using enthalpy values. And that brings us to this problem. Using entropy values from appendix C in our text, what is the delta S value for the following reactions? In order to address these questions, I'm of course going to turn to some pre-recorded footage from our doc cam. In this question, we actually have two different parts. In part one, which I've labeled part I, we're given the reaction of taking this molecule, which is called ethene, treating it with hydrogen gas, using that to make this molecule which is called ethane. We are asked to look in our appendix in the back of our book each of the S values or entropy values for each of these compounds. The entropy values for each of these compounds which I've looked up are the following. And I should point out that the units are in joules per mole Kelvin which I once again sometimes calls, call joules per mole. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'll ever stop thinking that's funny. You might remember from our text that the change in entropy for a reaction is equal to the sum of all of the individual entropy values multiplied by their individual coefficients of the products subtract, sorry, the analogous sum of the reactants. Thus, for this particular problem, the overall delta S for the reaction is equal to 229.5. That is the sum of all of the entropy value for all of the products, which is just one. You'll notice that the coefficient in front of this term is one, as well as those for the other reactants as well. So the product delta S minus the sum of the reactants entropy values. When I throw that into my calculator, the number that I end up getting is negative 120.48 joules per mole, or mole Kelvin. For part two, we're given a slightly different equation. We're given methanol, oxygen, undergoing a combustion reaction to form CO2 and water. Um, I have not written down here the individual states. All of these are gases. I'm just refraining from doing so to save myself time. However, it is very important to do that when you're looking up these values on the table. Otherwise, you will, may look up the 
values incorrectly. For example, the S value for methanol as a gas is different from that as a liquid. The same applies for each of the other components. The entropy values for each of these components that I have looked up are these. With that said, we'll apply the same equation we used in part I. We have to keep in mind now that we have coefficients. 2, 3, 2, and 4. Those are going to play a part as well. So the overall delta S for the reaction is going to be equal to 2 times 213.6 plus 4 times 188.83 minus 2 times 237.6 plus 3 times 205. These are, of course, each of the individual entropy values for the products multiplied by their respective coefficients, added together, subtracting the analogous values for the reactants. When I throw that into my calculator, I end up getting a final value of positive 92.32 joules per mole Kelvin. Now that seems like a good place for us to stop. Don't get too excited though. There's going to be more video footage, as I'm sure you guessed. <laughs> so please let your brain rest and then turn to our next video in which we will finish our discussion for Chapter 19's topic and coverage of chemical thermodynamics.